Hello to my air signs Libra, Aquarius and Gemini. Welcome to the Virgo New Moon. You'll find the timestamps for your rising sign listed below. Hello Libra rising, welcome to your horoscope for the new moon in Virgo, happening on Friday the 15th of September at 11.40am if you're in the southern hemisphere with me using Australian Eastern Standard Time, so switch it out for wherever you are. Um, how are you? Are you feeling alright? How was your full moon in Pisces? Mine was gorgeous. Uh, remember that Virgo is where we're headed this time around and that Mercury is still retrograde in that sign. So we get to look forward to Mercury stationing direct the day after this new moon. So if there is wires cross or miscommunications or anything like that, forgive me, um, the fire sign readings were a crack up. Um, I hope that I can get this clear for you. At a new moon, there'll be no moon in the sky. You know this. It's going to be black. So we get to work with our instinct more than anything else. We get to feel out what's left here on planet Earth in terms of energy energy, and, and you know feelings and all of that kind of thing. And we get to make a wish list of what we might like to see appear in our lives. For you, Virgo rules your 12th house, which is very private, Libra rising. This is the part of your chart that is like the unconscious chambers or the hidden world of your reality um, it can be like the um, yeah like the gateway the portal to perhaps the unconscious world so in tarot Virgo we can talk about Virgo when we talk about the hermit card so in the northern hemisphere there's a lovely relationship with this card in Virgo season for the idea of saying sayonara to the spring the summertime and entering into the fall or the autumn and harvesting you know everything that was grown over that time and hunkering down by the fire with some pumpkins etc etc to ruminate and to go inward as the hermit does the hermit's an incredibly wise character that um, some folks feel embarrassed about perhaps times when they've hermited or become a bit of a hermit. But I am, I used to be a bit like that. I used to feel a bit um, self-conscious about how much I enjoyed spending time alone until, until now when I realised that that period of time is kind of essential because that's when I read and that's when I sort of like ingest information and that's when I sort of go back to the studio maybe in terms of the proverbial studio and like experiment you can see that in the hermit's lantern is the star you know and the star is the brightness of, of opportunity in the tarot the star is the one that has the solutions for us so they're kind of building a bridge with that sort of spiritual essence and i like all of that sort of imagery spiritually heavy sort of imagery for you Libra rising because that's what we could maybe discuss in the 12th house maybe that sort of feeling of like mercury retrograde in your 12th has been like it's been maybe a bit confusing that channel or that portal to to your own sense of spirituality but at this new moon we get to kind of maybe think about that relationship that we have think about our spirituality think about our spiritual practices what we might like to um uh, like achieve moving forward and then once Mercury station is direct the following day then we can maybe put an action on that and be like right okay this is what I'm really interested in learning more about this is what I'm interested in like saying yes to this is how I'm going to find this avenue of you know education or, or something like that it, it, you know it's 12th house so it's also incredibly personal whatever you like to do you know keep it keep it keep it sacred um, yes, so that's the sort of energy with the moon that we're going to be working with. I can see a, like, sort of, I'm going to say gorgeous uh, square going off between you, Libra, and Cancer. 
So for you, Libra rising, Cancer is up there in your 10th house of your most public self, perhaps your career, your legacy, what you wish to be known for, all of those kinds of things. And the square that I'm discussing, so right, right angle, 90 degrees, pressure point, is between Athena, who we chatted all about last time in the Pisces full moon horoscope. Athena was the one with the olive branch, perhaps, that we were t I was discussing with you. And... So Athena has just entered Libra at zero degrees. So pivotal point, the, the first degree of your sign at this new moon. And the square that's happening is with Vesta, who has just entered Cancer in your 10th house of your career. All of that is to say is that there's something here about striking a match and taking your spirituality seriously in public now don't be scared like you don't have to you don't have to shout it from the rafters but if we can work with the feeling of vesta another word for vesta is hestia uh hestia vesta is the keeper of the sacred flame of spirituality um, there has been a multiplicity of different ways that folks used to worship Vesta in the classical days. Um, one of my favorite stories is the intense healing properties of one's sexuality. Doesn't have to ring true for you, but I'll just tell you the story. Um, some sets, some, some uh, chapters of worship the, um, that worship Hestia in the Greek times specifically, uh, they would make love to the soldiers returning home from war to cleanse them of the horrors of war that they were subjected to with the divine heat and flame of sexual contact, of, of making love as a powerful force. That's just one way that we can work with, with um, Vesta. This square with Athena, who, and the interesting thing is both of these goddesses were um, uh, virginal, so you know, probably nice to talk to talk about them during Virgo season, you know. Um, but what I'm kind of uh, locking into is unpicking some of this sort of like sacredness of the virgin image, because that sort of seems to be a bit of a construct of. Um, control don't you agree the, i like the autonomy of athena i like the idea of the sort of responsibility that athena felt of being devoted to strategy that was her wisdom was strategy and this idea of being chaste or being virginal was not for purity it was for absolute conviction of knowing what line she was treading of having no need for any other way. There's a beautiful blog that I'm getting more involved in reading. It's called hellenian.org. I'm going to spell that for you. H-E-L-L-E-N-I-O-N.org. Look them up. They're incredible fount of resources as far as um, going through the the classic stories, the ancient myths. And in one reading of Athena, there's a sensibility of like asexuality, which is a very modern term, but it's a term of empowerment too. Not everybody responds to a sense of sexuality. Some folks are completely f like f uh, fine and thriving without a relationship with their sexuality. Do you start, this is a clunky way of saying that we, it's our responsibility to move away from some of these old tropes of pure, unpure, you know, heathen, un, you know, do you understand what I mean? That's why I told you the sexy story about Vesta because, you know, it's, there was the Vestal Virgins too, which were chaste to honour um, Vesta. But that was in the Roman times, that was sort of, as we were sort of rapidly sort of, you know, the mess of all of this, constriction and construction do what you feel is right i reckon libra rising you don't have to be anybody other than who you are and perhaps some of this 12th house virgo chat can maybe like twig some some inspiration for you 
think about what you have in your first house. Think about the sort of wisdom of Athena and think about the, like, okay, we're going to talk Queen of Swords, Queen of Fire. Let's, let's do tarot speak. Queen of Swords is in your first, so convinced. Queen of Fire is up in your tenth. Like, let's make this happen. This could be another little construct that is working for you at this new moon. As we're sort of swimming deep in the 12th house, like what's the spark that's lit up in your 10th house? What's, what's the next um, idea for you uh, in, your, in your public world? Are you building some sort of confidence or some sort of voice enough to be like, this is what I believe. This is what I'm interested in learning about. This is my line of worship. That could be something as well. Let, let me get some tarot out for you, Libra. Please keep in mind that Mercury is still uh, retrograde. So hopefully these lions aren't too crossed. Um, the artwork behind me is called Mr. Right, by the way. It's by, um, I found it for a very good price in an op shop. And it's actually by an incredible Japanese artist called Shiroki and I can't believe my luck it's beautiful though isn't it all right the hermit in the center so we're going back to the 12th house Libra rising we're going back to the unconscious world we're being relaxed enough that we need this time away, that we're going to sort of like start channeling. We're gonna like investigate our spirituality even further. Something's been lit in you. You're like, okay, so where, like what, what next? Um, the Seven of Swords is here to remind you of trusting your own instinct. I think as moving through this land of spirituality, there's a lot of people that are sitting on the top of their own mountain and wanting to um, guru, guru the bejeebas out of you. Irrelevant. Irrelevant. This, it feels private to me. Obviously, there's folks that we can learn from and there's books that we can read and there's um, seminars that we can attend and listen to. You know, there's... Of course. But anything that feels like a 10 step program or a 12 step program or a, um, a path to enlightenment. I'd be wary of that only because of, you know, the global history that we're all living through. When it comes to these lessons and these relationships, when it comes to tarot, the first rule of tarot is what you see is the truth. And that's how we sort of open up our relationship with our intuitive possibilities. You read it first, Re see it, read it. And of course you can feel that, you can back that up as I do in my life. I sort of back all of this up with my own form of study and I, different ways of learning. I'm going to come back to that um, website as well. I think you might like it, Libra Rising. But I have here the Queen of Cups as well. So this is, think, I'm thinking about cancer right now because of that sort of watery, emotional kind of um, availability. The Queen of Cups is someone that's sort of maybe on your periphery, it's someone in your environment who's incredibly kind and um, empathetic and they've got great big ears to listen to you. They've got a huge cup that is ever flowing. So you're not taking from them, uh, you're not depleting their supply of emotional availability, I'll put it that way. They've got it to spare. So perhaps use this time here and if you're down here in the southern hemisphere with me then maybe you're sort of re-emerging from this period and you're hungry for more the lesson or the guidance is be careful of who's out there you know check your back check your trust your gut to trust your in, like some things sound cliche because they're just really great to say because they're the truth trust your intuition it's it's a, it's a hack-laboured thing to hear time and time again, especially when 
you kind of feel that folks don't know what they mean or that they don't it's just a it's just a platitude but really like sometimes our animal instinct kicks in and we can feel if we can trust or not straight away like a dog you know if you could have a relationship with animals where you sort of watch them and they're sort of like they will trust and then they won't like it's one to yeah one to um have a lot of faith in if it doesn't feel right to you libra rising then it's not it's not right go with what feels right um and i think this and this is just a moment in time to this and a lot of astrologers don't really read the the um asteroids so much like this you know it's it's not part of their it just it's just singing out to me because after all is said and done and the work that we did in your sixth house last fortnight it's just i have a feeling anyway that something's about to tick over like i feel really kind of um available and maybe if you can identify with that feeling then make it work for you make it work for you like learn more about vesta learn more about athena um go to this website i think you're the only person that i've told you know h-e-l-l-e-n-i-o-n dot org like they look really cool and there's a multitude of different voices too it's not there's there's not sort of yeah like there's a multiplicity of gods and goddesses in these sort of mythologies these archetypes there's also it's great to learn from a multiplicity of different um guides and and um instructors too so plenty of different voices there plenty of different perspectives a lot of really updated perspectives as well so yeah that was garbled full disclosure i'm aware of how it's not been easy for me this time i'm going to blame it on mercury but i also think that there's some nuggets in there too i think that if you've been questioning your own sense of belonging in the sort of spiritual space if you're about to embark on a project that you're sort of thinking to yourself mm, i don't think that i'm qualified or i don't think that i'm i've got the stuff um then maybe use this reading as an encouragement to be like well actually athena's really convinced in your first house and vesta is like she's up there with her box of matches just like mhm mm what do you want to do <laughs> let's do it let's start let's do it let's be bold about it too 12th house work can be a bit spooky trust yourself libra rising trust yourself that you've got the stuff to do it and also trust virgo that they're very grounded they're practical earthbound there's a sense of reality with virgo so you can feel safe enough to take a bit of a deeper swim yeah maybe yeah revise the pisces horoscope from 2 weeks ago maybe see if see if um your memory is tweaked when you watch that one that's it from me libra rising i love you very much um you can tip me over at buymeacoffee.com forward slash uma ruby i can read your birth chart over at umaruby.com they look like this um i will speak to you in two weeks we're going to talk about the full moon in aries bit of a plot twist there is no eclipse at this one because it's a dragon's head issue but i'll explain that to you in the next horoscope but we are going to be gearing up for the first eclipse in your first house which is happening the fortnight after so if we think about it a month from now there's going to be an eclipse in your first house so perhaps you use this new moon as like grounded preparation to um take the trip with the dragon's tail Uh oh we'll see i love you libra rising bye Hello Aquarius rising welcome to your horoscope for the new moon in Virgo happening on Friday the 15th of September at 11:40 a.m. if you're using Australian Eastern Standard Time so let's get busy if you remember in the last horoscope i gave you a bit of a warning a bit of a trigger warning that we might be talking about some some um trickier things in this reading then 
I'll remind you if you don't, if you didn't remember. Also, I want to ask you about the Pisces full moon. How did that go for you? What happened? Did you feel that there was some like opportunity there? Was there something about your imagination that started to sort of brew a little bit? Were you thinking about your second house of your coin, your values, your money, all of that stuff? Were there possibilities or different pathways that maybe opened up for you? And some of them were a bit sort of full on and maybe a bit far fetched. But in that possibility, how do you feel now? I'm reluctant to sort of put a stopper on anyone using their imagination. I think that that's the, one of the most powerful tools that we all have. If we can still dream and still imagine at whatever age or stage of development in life, then we're going to be fine. So yeah, maybe do a little bit of rumination about the full moon as we prepare for this new moon in Virgo. So Virgo in the tarot is the hermit card. And maybe in the northern hemisphere, this can be described as we sort of release ourselves from the weather of summer and enter into the fall or the autumn, then we can kind of really feel that hermit sort of um, whispering to us, like, come inside, let's, let's go back into the cave. And that's okay, it was just a bit of wax. That scared the shit out of me. <gasps> let's keep going. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's kind of the opposite sort of reaction. We can feel that the weather is changing. It's giving way to the spring. The perfume is like full in the air at the moment. Um, the sun is really bright and it's sort of like starting to um, show itself more often. Um, today, the day that I'm filming these horoscopes, I mean, yeah, it's been... There's something in the air, i got to say, Aquarius rising. Like, I've been feeling really manic. Um, the weather has been like chopping from like brightness and perfume and like a big punch in the face of like happiness, springtime, and then almost instantly like, like a tap being turned off and then it's grey and raining. It's chopping and changing. It's actually probably a really good like physical description of a mutable sign. You're a fixed sign, Aquarius rising, so you hold the distance, you hold the weather of the season. Mutable signs are impressionable, they give way to the next. So there's something here about maybe if you're in the Southern Hemisphere with me, it's kind of like hood off, let's go out and let's reconnect. Let's see one another. That could be something that you're feeling. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it could be like, right, I'm ready. Let's go inward. Let's like ruminate, contemplate, think it over. Virgo for you rules your eighth house, Aquarius rising. And this is where we learn about grief. This is where we feel the intensity of human connection and where those lessons are given to us in terms of the inevitability of saying goodbye. Yeah. It's, it can also be to do with how your resources are interwoven with other folks as well. So on a, on a fiscal level, it can have things to do with like inheritance and taxes and things like that. All of these topics are kind of hard for me to decipher how on earth would you make a new moon manifestation in this house when it's got to do with taxes and um, things like that. I'm not very fiscally minded. My mind goes to this sort of intensity of, of, of human connection. And at a new moon here, my mind sort of goes to asking for the next bit of wisdom in regard to that topic. We're all at different stages of our development and I know that I am in some parts of my life I feel really like, you know, my prowess is pretty spot on. I feel really knowledgeable and learned. In other parts of my life I feel like a kid still. There's many things that I don't know and there's many things that I could like ask for more guidance on. I think about Virgo, the sign, and I think about guidance. I think about mutable earth. I think of clay, I think of something kind of um, inviting and, and malleable as well. 
when you think about your eighth house, when you think about relationships, that there is definitely some sort of cosmic bond and there's definitely the inevitability of having to say goodbye, which can be fill, fill us with fear. I wonder if you can think about that and if you can use this new moon in Virgo to ask for the next bit of knowledge, the next bit of wisdom on that topic. That would be a great thing to do, I reckon, Aquarius rising. And that keeps it sort of like, yeah, that keeps the door open, doesn't it? Yeah. I can, it can be pretty trepidatious in the eighth house. Um, some people are really awesome in the eighth house. Some people have a lot of placements in their eighth house, which means that they are really good at the harder stuff. They've got a great deal of knowledge about how to say goodbye. Um, some people don't. And yeah, some people it's kind of harder to look at too. Um, there is that. There's also a little bit of heat going on in your seventh house, which is just across the way from you, Aquarius rising. Aquarius, house of the first self, soul, rising intention. Leo in the seventh, the other, our lovers, our friendships, our, our, our bonds. Perhaps in some way it's our working relationships to our clients, those sorts of folks that are in our kind of inner circle. Right now, Venus, who's been there for a little while, so I'd be interested to hear how that's all going, is about to form an exact conjunction with the asteroid Juno which is another word for Hera, who is queen of the gods. And in astrology, Juno can point to our relationships, it can point to our sense of commitment and how we commit. I know that v uh, Aphrodite and Hera had a checkered past. I definitely know that from some of the stories. Um, in fact, back to Priapus, if you can remember, Hera was the one that, that cursed Aphrodite's um, pregnancy because she was pregnant with Zeus and Hera was like no it's going to be an ugly baby and out came Priapus so there's that one just one of the stories in astrology though I think that I like this I like this um configuration because we must remember that a lot of these stories are in the hand of man right so we get to we get to interact with the mythology and when I think of Venus and I think of Venus in Leo and I think of my freshly washed hair <laughs> And I think of Juno and commitment and um, like I think the best thing that I love about Hera is her like commitment. She's like, I've, I, I'm the queen of the freaking gods. I could go anywhere. I could be with anyone. I'm committed to you, mate. I'm committed to you. Like, let's work this out. That's how I like to think of Hera. Yeah. Some of this sort of like, you know, vindictive sort of um, behaviors. Look, we're all capable of all sorts of behaviors sorry back to the astrology i like this for you aquarius rising because it feels like there's sort of like some sort of union here there's something in your seventh house that might just about with a little bit of extra fairy dust might be about to grow so have a little think about that there too and have a think about who you are in contact with who you are in relationship with who you are sharing your time with it might just be like another like celebration or like fount of like ah, oh, yeah babe it's us that could be how you're feeling as well um and nice to sort of uh, provide some of that um some of that warmth and some of that pleasure as we investigate and negotiate our eighth house yeah i like it this painting behind me is called Mr. Right. It's by an incredible Japanese artist called Shiroki, and I found it in an opportunity shop for $20. And I am so effing lucky. And I've had it for a while, and I like to bring out this painting when talking about love spells and love rituals. And I brought it here because there's a lot of that kind of feeling going on in the astro weather, I think, anyway. And it might be nice to sort of like further exacerbate that. A love spell, for me anyway, is simply just making an altar 
and just thinking about it, imagining about it. And after a long time of winter, it's such a relieving feeling to come back into your own personal spring and be like, mm, I'm actually blossoming. <laughs> and that's when a love spell can happen. So yeah, Mr. Right, hey, let's have a think. Let's get some tarot. There's been this feeling of like being held in place, but kind of really going with that flow, maybe feeling a bit like you are not in control, but you're okay with that. It's remarkable, isn't it, sometimes Aquarius rising, when you really make the pact with yourself and with Gaia, with Mother Nature, to be like, I relinquish control, I'm going to be like the seasons and I'm going to be open and receptive to what happens. I'm not going to try and control this situation. It's such a freeing moment, isn't it? When you really actually physically feel that happen in you. It's all well and good to sort of think about it and be like, well, that's a responsible thing to do. I should, you know, be less controlling, whatever. I should stop being so anxious. Such a funny thought, isn't it? I should stop being so anxious. It just makes you more anxious. You can feel it in your body when you're like, I am submitting and not in an act of like being, um, um, I'm not sub in that way. I'm just relinquishing my sense of control here so I can allow some of this movement. That's what I feel for you, Aquarius rising. And it seems that this sort of like, channel or this possible opportunity this what appears to be some sort of portal gateway into a new path it feels to me that it's been a little bit of a juggling act and perhaps there's been you had to reassess exactly if it's worth it to make this road to go down this pathway and you'll let me know if you've decided or not, if that's the way that it's going to go. But look who this is. In some versions of tarot, the pages are actually called the princesses. <laughs> so this is the princess of wands. This is someone who is has magic running through their fingers. And they've been that way since birth. The pages or the princesses sometimes can be read as a sort of like an energy of like naivete in other readings in other versions of this card or the concept the the literature the philosophy behind the card this is someone who's a, this is a child of fire they were raised by wolves they were raised by magic this is someone who has an innate talent for it this is someone who's going to stoke your fire again this is someone who you can trust is doing everything from instinct and from intuition. This is someone that is maybe even guiding you or lighting your way. We think about this wand as like a torch, you know, guiding you into the next adventure. I love the four of ones. And this is your gateway, your portal, your possibility. I wonder how this juggling or how this feeling of like, it kind of feels like, oh, it's a lot of eggs to put in one basket or oh, I've got to, you know, can I, can I maintain this in order to fully enjoy this? That's the question here, Aquarius rising but the opportunity is waiting for you on the other end there. Ooh, I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Best of luck with your eighth house ritual. 
and also approach it with some optimism. Some opportunity awaits you, I think, Aquarius rising. And you can work with this house. You can work with this feeling. You can work with the Ten of Pentacles. Because of the sun and the moon are at 21 degrees of Virgo. This is the card that we chat about in the third decan of Virgo. There's something of a legacy being built here. And I will say to you, as I've said to a couple of other folks, that when I look at the pentacles, they don't always represent money to me. Mm -mm. That's too... That's too predictable. <laughs> Maybe they could... Those pentacles could represent wisdom or knowledge. We ask ourselves at the end of it, at the end of the pentacle cycle, what do we have that we can leave behind and spread around? And if that's wisdom, shit, that's priceless. So maybe use some of that in your eighth house manifestation too. Big love to you, darling. Happy new moon. Um, you can tip me over at buymeacoffee.com forward slash umaruby. Um, I can read your birth chart over at umaruby.com if you'd like. They look like this. And we'll go through it together via Zoom. Uh, what else? Yeah, throw me, throw me a whatever in the comments. Just let me know that you're here. That'd be awesome. The um, interaction helps encourage whatever. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, also, yeah, I'm going to be back with you in two weeks to talk about the full moon in Aries. Bit of a plot twist. There's no eclipse at this one because the dragon's head is too far away. However, yeah, well, I'll, I'll fill you in. But we're, pre we're prepping ourselves for eclipse season. But there's not going to be an eclipse in Aries this time around. It's kind of like a handover. It's a changing of the season. Everything feels really mutable, really malleable right now. It feels to me, Aquarius rising, that we're about to relinquish our control and step into the new phase of life. With this handover with the um, eclipse points to it kind of feels like that. We've got a culmination of lessons coming up soon enough that we'll talk about too. It's wild. Can't wait. Love you heaps. Take care. Hello Gemini Rising, welcome to your horoscope for the new moon in Virgo happening on Friday the 15th of September at 11.40am using Australian Eastern Standard Time. So switch out your time zone so you know when this is going to be happening. Uh, we're going to be talking about your fourth house, Gemini Rising. The fourth house is where we think about our home, our roots, our privacy, our ancestry, and our bloodline. And some of those topics are difficult to face, aren't they? Some of them can be really painful. Some of them can bring up some emotions that we've been finding it difficult to work with. Sometimes when we think about the fourth house, we can have a lot of gratitude too. And when we look around in our lives and we think about the root structure, that we're building for ourselves, we can think to ourselves, I made this. <laughs> this is great. This is amazing. The day after this new moon in, in Virgo, Mercury will have stationed direct, which means that everything over the past three weeks, those wires that were crossed, those confrontations, those sorts of like misunderstandings, maybe sometimes, um, there's been a real encouragement for all of us to like hold tight and be like okay if that's a, seems like a wild miscommunication or a misunderstanding um i'm gonna like not blame it on mercury but just be like okay well look that's happening that that's also an invitation for me to go over the details of something here as well and really like check it and and revise my rebuttal too so after this new moon, after we've experienced the black night, remember there's no moon in the sky at a new moon, so we use our instinct, we use our magic too, and we get to really kind of think about what we might like to develop in our fourth house, Gemini rising. What other 
plants do you wish to grow? What do you wish to uproot and plant somewhere else? What do you wish to um, foster or feed to grow even more? That's what we do at a new moon. We get to kind of ruminate on our fourth house, ruminate on that principle and make some wishes. So while that's all happening, the day after Mercury will station direct and then I guarantee, well, don't quote me, <laughs> I suspect, I imagine that there's going to be a free flow of movement and clearer communication and clearer details being shared and kind of if we can all be really gentle with one another and be like what did you mean when you said that oh okay now i get it or that's your perspective whoa that's a lot to i'm going to hold off from responding to that once mercury is stationed direct then you can respond to it then you can be like okay i'm going over what i've absorbed from about this and now i'm going to put this solution forward I hope that makes sense to you, Gemini Rising. Um, now, if you think about the full moon in Pisces two weeks ago and all of that conversation that we had about your 10th house, your most public self, how people know you, how they see you, that kind of... Remember, the 10th is the most invisible part of the chart at the very top. We think about Neptune. We thought about that sort of like... Um, uh, possibility for delusion there and there was the olive branch in the fourth that was sort of being handed over do you remember all of that talk well we're kind of revisiting that in some way the luminaries are in the fourth so there is major focus on the fourth your roots your your privacy what you're building for yourself but the way that i'm looking at this chart too there is something of a bow and arrow now excuse my scribbles but i wonder if you can even make that out Maybe not. I need to, this is just my notes, but it looks to me like there's a bow and arrow between the luminaries. So the sun and the moon in the base of your chart, they are forming this bow with Pluto and Capricorn in your eighth house, Uranus in Taurus in your 12th house, and the arrow is in Neptune in your 10th house. So you can see there's that triangle of support amongst the earth signs. There's been a great deal of kind of like practical lessons that you've been going through and you've been learning. You've been also kind of revolutionizing perhaps some of your ideas about the, re the real world. Perhaps there's been things where you've sort of thought, oh, that's not really a possibility, but now it's kind of like, mm, F it. That is a possibility. I'm going to go for it. This feels like support and maybe this wish that we can make with this new moon, it's it's being informed by some pretty powerful planets too. I mean, these are all the outer planets, so they do take a while to go around. So this configuration, it's unusual. It's not precise too, but it feels like we're almost going back to the, the 10th house. There's something about public and private here, Gemini rising. And there's something about the sort of like mix or the dance between the two. Perhaps there's a way that you're perceived publicly that, um, well, of course there is. I mean, I think everyone's maybe in that way. That happens for everyone. There's definitely a, a, a separation between our public perception and our private perception. What we give publicly, what we give privately. There's an imaginative, creative, mystical little fairy part of you, Gemini rising. And they're being, there's a, they're being focused on. So I wonder if there's a marriage between your fourth and your tenth that we can create too. Maybe there's something about your fourth house of your ancestry or privacy or home there's something in that world that could do with a little bit more magic or imagination maybe there's sort of conversations that you might be feeling confident enough and and relaxed enough to have with certain parts of your ancestry and these could be people that aren't here too Sometimes we can talk to those that have said goodbye. In fact, 
very, very, very great friend of mine once said sometimes, she said that I love the way that death really opens us up to life, to that's just, I'm not sure, but that could be something in there for you, Gemini. <laughs> let's get some tarot and let's get stuck into the possibilities. I got two. Ah! great big chunk. Let's see. <clears throat> so it feels to me, Gemini rising, that there's, there's, you're moving away from the argumentative uh, battle of, of, of mental supremacy. It seems that you've maybe caught in some kind of argument or um, face off could be with someone it could be with yourself it definitely has to do with you see that sort of like you know grand portal the four of ones there they're sort of like it's 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 like a celebration you know congratulate yourself that kind of feeling this Yeah, this, this is, I believe this for you, Gemini rising. I believe that you've got your eyes on this. This is what you know. Life is, this is how you're structuring your life and this is what you want your life to look like. We're moving away from this bullshit freaking back and forth um, fight for mental supremacy. I f it feels really tiring and you can see that these folks in the background here are like, mm, you know what, drop the chop. I'm not arguing with you about this anymore. This is bull effing shit. I'm moving away because this is sacred to me. I know what I'm doing. This is my life and I'm effing proud of it. I really am. You're about to um, get some really loving, supportive comfort. Someone's going to offer you a really beautiful cup of either like peace or understanding. Someone's approaching you at the moment, Gemini, with a like, like a loving possibility, um, like it could just be like a shoulder to cry or it could be like a I'm so sorry that that's been said to you I don't believe it you're this or something like that the knight of cups is someone that's really kind of like emotionally available to be with you they can sometimes get a bit carried away with that you know I can sort of like talk talk, talk a lot you know but they're, they're sort of they're coming from a place that they're, they're trusting their feelings and they feel they feel um safe enough to be vulnerable with you too it's also not, it doesn't feel to me like there's sort of any solution here though, because in your like perceived bondage, you know, in that kind of feeling of like, oh, this really feels kind of like I'm trapped. But if I can just actually let go of control of this, like really like let it go, which is maybe a difficult thing sometimes. I know I have a Gemini moon, so sometimes that's an impossibility unless I really, really commit to that idea. We can get so anxious when we're... And it's not about being a control freak or anything like that. It's kind of really about being like, I can't believe this is happening. This is one example. I can't believe this is happening. I don't want this to happen. I wish that this wouldn't happen. But if you it's just, that's, that's energy is getting stuck there. So it's not, there's no room for it to move. Whereas when the hang one shows up, it's kind of like, oh, I'm hanging by my foot by a tree. <sighs> I'm hanging by my foot by a tree. Like, that's fine. What do I see now from this? flipped perspective what can I open myself up to am I in danger don't know I feel like I'm safe am I in pain no what do I have a lot of time yeah what can I what can I receive from this It almost feels like to me, Gemini Rising, that there's like been like a break, like a circuit break. 
you can take yourself, remove yourself from the situation and give yourself some of this time, this hanged one time. So maybe if you've peeled off, you know, from this, taken ourselves away from this, rather than taking yourself away to sort of like try and strategize and try and get it friggin' organized in the mind, give yourself a bit of leeway to be a bit, um, like just relinquish that control. Just set it down for the moment. Because I feel that if you're in company with someone with a lot of love, you know, they're going to be like available for you and, you know, uh, maybe not trying to sort of like provide solutions, but definitely, definitely aiding this sort of feeling of re relaxation. Just sort of like, I'm actually just going to like leave this for the moment. Because once you, oh, once you do, holy moly, so much can open up. It's such a, and it's a hard thing to grapple with when you're a Gemini. I get it. Told you I'm a Gemini moon. Conversations at all time in the old noggin. Hello, hello, what? Uh, uh. So much. When the twins can put a sock in it for a minute and then you realise how in tune you are with the planet around you. I hope that you're in nature, Gemini, or I hope that you can get to nature and yeah, like feel a part of it. Mm. All of this stuff. Oh, congratulations. I want to say to this card. Oh, you're so clever. You won. Well done. Ugh. Far and away. Open yourself up. To the world around you. <laughs> I love you, Gemini Rising, very, very much. Um, take it easy with this one. And remember that it's a new moon. So, like, you might have, yeah, you, you might have um, say-so. You can interact with this lunation. The full moon, sometimes we, like, bask in the glow and we release and we give back. We let go of what we don't need. The new moons, we can be a bit more animalistic and use our instincts. Think about that fourth house. Think about your home, your roots, your ancestry, all of that stuff. The Ten of Pentacles is singing to me too. I've got this card out. This is the last decan of Virgo. So there's three wedges to each sign. The sun and the moon are at 21 degrees of Virgo. So that's the last wedge. And this is the tarot card for the last wedge of Virgo. When I look at these coins, I see wisdom. And if this card is about legacy and what you're going to leave the next generation what you're going to give give back and these coins are wisdom <laughs> babe that's priceless think about it that way love you um you can tip me at buymeacoffee.com forward slash umaruby if you like i can read your birth chart which looks like this or something like this at umaruby.com you can book yourself in a session with me and i'll draw you one up especially uh i'll be with you in two weeks and we'll talk about the full moon in aries plot twist though it's not an eclipse we're gearing up to eclipse season but the dragon's head is too far away from this full moon in aries so it slips through the cracks so let's um let's work with that one um what else can i say i think that's it i'll throw in any kind of emoji whatever you want in the comments that'd be great i've got to go love you let's look forward to mercury stationing direct right mm -hmm. bye